So uh, I'm going to just dive in, <laughs> unless there's uh, any questions. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Feel free to shout questions out as opposed to putting your hand up, because as you probably noticed, we don't notice hands that are up unless you wave them or something. Like, yeah. That's uh, um, all right, so if everybody's on, on board, then so uh, I want to pick it up where I left it off, and that is, uh, so I, I was telling you the story that Einstein's equations basically turn into the Friedman equation, which is basically this, that uh, h squared, remember h is, is a dot over a, so it's basically the first derivative of, uh, of the scale factor, the thing we're trying to find, and that's given by the energy density up to factors of Newton's constant. And um, so then if it were true that the universe was, had just one thing in it, so, so it, we, we needed to have an equation of state in order to integrate this because we needed to know how to relate uh, rho to uh, A. And so the argument there was that uh, we know that the energy, the total energy in the universe is conserved which relates it to uh, the, its rate of change in time to the pressure. So, that, so the, the, the assumption was, if the total energy of the universe had a specific equation of state, say it was radiation or say it was matter, we went through a several equations of state, then the equation of state and conservation told us what the A dependence was. So if it was radiation, the energy dependence of uh, the energy density of radiation had to fall off like one over A to the fourth, if uh, you know, that's, what, that's, what, that's what energy conservation told us. If we had just matter, energy conservation said that uh, the energy density of matter uh, had to fall off like one over a cubed. And for just the vacuum, the energy density was a constant. And so, um, so if it were true that all we had was one of those three on the right-hand side, we can integrate everything. And that led to a bunch of predictions for how this universe would grow, and, and it turned out that if, the, if we had radiation, then the universe was going to grow proportional to the square root of time. The interesting thing about that is that if you plot that, you know, A against time, square root, you know, it does something like this. It goes zoop. So it's zero at a finite time. So that means that that's the Big Bang. It, it, it's not like it goes to zero really slowly, really slowly, slowly. It goes to zero, boom, and the slope here is like infinite. So that means that, uh, you know, the universe, the first you know, nanoseconds is growing faster than the speed of light. And that's kind of where a lot of the paradoxes come in. Uh, the things that you, the way you can get a sky that doesn't know how it's all supposed to be at the same temperature is because this is growing like gangbusters at the very beginning. And so you're getting sort of a, you're getting a universe that's getting bigger faster than light can catch up to it. So that's the, that's what radiation would have done. Matter would have been a similar story, but not exactly the same. The power changes, it's two thirds rather than a half. And then vacuum domination was different qualitatively in that uh, you know, these the ones are all concave to the right. This one is concave up. And so it's the, this is the, of these three, these two had a dot dot less than zero. So they're decelerating expansions. And that, remember, there was a, one of the Einstein equations said that if the pressure and the energy was positive, we should expect a dot dot to be negative. And that was true for these two. This is one for which a dot dot is positive. So that's an accelerating expansion. And uh, that was related to the fact that the pressure for the vacuum, if the energy density for the vacuum is positive, then the pressure has to be negative because they're opposites. Yeah? Is there a way to find the energy density of the vacuum? Yep. <laughs> right, yeah, if, if you, your intuition is that, is that nothing should go faster than light, so how, how did that happen? And in, in, in relativity, things can go faster. You know, if I have a flashlight and I spin it, then the beam you know, way out there, in principle, is going faster than the speed of light. But it, so there's no information, as, they, as you said. That's the, that's the relevant thing. So, so the, 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 you know, the, the, the mathematical answer would be um, the important thing is really causality. That there's a, there was a, can you make predictions of the future uh, from the past that are sensible given that, that you're not agreeing on what the ordering of events is. And so the, it's the existence of the light cone and the fact that all signals move inside the light cone, that's the thing that you can't give up because that's the thing you need to predict the future from the past. And having a, you know, the, the scale factor go faster at the speed of light doesn't really affect any of that. So it's, it doesn't stop you predicting the future. So it's not a causality problem. 
many questions? So, so that's what would have happened if you had only one of those things, but of course we have more than one of those things, and so then uh, what really happens, and what really happens in the standard picture uh, is an assumption, and, 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 and the, 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 real, the, the important issue is you know, the energy densities are gonna add because energies add, and so the energy density of the universe is gonna be the sum of the vacuum plus the matter plus the radiation, but the thing I've written here, I've written more than that here because I, I didn't just write vacuum, matter, and radiation. I wrote the A-dependence of these contributions. And you remember the A-dependence followed from conservation if that's all you had. And so what we know is that the total rho and the total P satisfy that energy conservation equation that relates rho dot to P. But we don't know that that has to be true separately for each thing when we start dividing it up into sub subsectors. But it would be true for each of them separately if they weren't interacting with each other, because the thing that will, the thing that would make uh, the matter density not separately be conserved would be if I have a mechanism for transferring energy between matter and radiation, then their sum will be conserved, but the matter by itself won't be conserved because it can lose energy to radiation, which will then gain it, and so the total will be conserved. And that's not an academic issue. If you, I'm gonna later on split the matter into baryons and non-baryons, and the radiation into photons and neutrinos, but for a large history of the universe, the photons and the baryons were talking to each other because they all they interacted electromagnetically, so they were in thermal equilibrium, and so they had a common temperature, and so their energy density was set by their temperature, and it had to be the same thing. Whereas if they were separately conserved, they would want to be scaling differently with the universe as the universe expanded. And so something had to give there, and what gives is if, if the radiation and the matter are in equilibrium, then you use energy, so you, you then you know how the energy is related to the temperature as a function of the equation of state of the radiation and the matter. But then what you use the energy conservation for is to calculate the temperature dependence. And so that, that tells you how the temperature evolves. And from that, you can figure out how the radiation and the matter evolves. But because they're in equilibrium, they, they, they stay together. And, and, and that's worked out in the, if you look up the notes, the effective theory of inflation notes, I worked the example of radiation, of, uh, radiation coupled to matter in equilibrium. And you can kind of see that the who wins depends on how much entropy is in the radiation or the matter. And it's gonna turn out, when I get over to that board, that there's more entropy in our universe in the radiation. There's more photons around than there are baryons. So what happens is that in practice, the, uh, the, the baryons are the slaves and the radiation are the, are the people that tell everybody what to do. So, so while the baryons are in equilibrium with the photons, they behave like photons, basically. They're just dragged along by the protons. And you'll see that that has an observable signal that we're gonna talk about later on. So if, that, if it's true that the vacuum and the matter sector and the radiation sector don't exchange information, so they're, they're separately conserved, which is true for a lot of the universe, but there are exceptions where the baryons and the photons are the main ones, then it will be true that this, what I wrote here, will be correct, that the, the pressure and the energy density will add and the A dependence of each separately will be what it would be when it's conserved separately. So the pressure part, the pressure of the vacuum was minus the energy density of the vacuum. The pressure of the matter was zero, basically, and then the pressure of the radiation was one-third the energy density of the radiation. And so then you can go to town and you can solve Einstein's equations again. And it's the same Hubble story, but now the, um, that, that whole sum of rho is on the right-hand side. And so that's what people stick in the computer and evaluate when they are uh, figuring out what the Hubble scale looks like as a function of redshift. So they write it uh, in this particular way, they write it in terms of this variable omega rather than rho, just because uh, they know something about what is going on now, which is what I'm about to talk about. So, so if you take this statement that h squared is rho and rho is the sum of radiation, matter, vacuum, and I put curvature back in here um, because I'm gonna get rid of it again, but just to remind you about why it's not there. Uh, so what, what people do is they write this in terms of the values of everything now. And what we know is that the sum of the densities, you know, rho radiation plus rho matter plus rho vacuum and the curvature that was there, has to be consistent with the geometry of space being flat. So within, I said 10% earlier, but it's actually 1%. I looked it up again. Um, so, and that's because of this triangle argument, right? When you look at the CMB, the, there's a known length on the other side of the universe. You know, the... There's a known size of the universe, which is basically the Hubble scale, and there's a known angle, and so the triangles are all over-determined, 
so you can tell if they're satisfying Euclidean geometry or not, and they are. And so that information essentially says that this curvature thing is consistent with zero at the one percent level. And so that's why. So that and then so then the, the what, what's left here, it's uh, conventional to scale out the values of uh, uh, since you measure the Hubble scale, you just call this thing the Hubble scale now times stuff that's one now. So you normalize out all the densities by the density now. And because the curvature is zero, the density now is related to the Hubble scale now in this way. It's related by the Friedman equation. So when someone tells you the value of the Hubble scale now, you can figure out this critical density, which is the thing that turns out to be 10 to the minus 29 grams per cubic centimeter. That's the density of the universe. That's what the Einstein's equations, together with the knowledge that the universe is flat at a given time, is telling us that the energy density now is that much. So that's the first thing we learn, is that independent of what you can see, just by looking at the shape of the universe, the fact you can measure the shape of the universe at a given time is telling you, by Einstein's equations, what the average energy density of the universe is, regardless of whether you can see it. So that's a known thing, given the assumptions that Einstein's equations are right, and so on and so on. So because of uh, that normalization story, these omegas have to sum to one. So, the, uh, so you can think of omega as being the fraction of what's out there now that's in every species of stuff that's out there now. So, uh, so if you put the, the, eight, you know, the scale de factor dependence in explicitly, so the radiation is one over a to the fourth, the matter is one over a cubed, and the vacuum is constant, then the only thing you're really arguing about is what's the fraction of those things now. So I've written a naught over a, where a is a, a naught is a now. So these factors are all one now, and so that means omega r naught plus omega m naught plus omega v naught has to add up to one. That's the statement that we've measured that the universe is flat. So I'm going to show you some slides which argue about why the values for these things are what I'm telling you. But first, let me tell you the values. So, so all the evidence is that there's two kinds of radiation now. See, everything we what we call radiation was stuff that's relativistic now, and that includes photons. We know that there are photons there. We know, in particular, the microwave background photons are there. And it turns out, you know, there's also starlight. The stars have been shining for a long time. There's a lot of, a lot of light around. It turns out there's way more light in the microwave background than there is in any starlight integrated over the history of the universe. So it turns out, and, and you know how much there is because it's a thermal distribution of photons whose temperature you know. It's 2.715 something degrees. And so that turns out to be an energy density in photons, which is 0.261 MeV per cubic meter, which is like one per cubic millimeter. So the universe has got about a photon for every cubic millimeter, a microwave photon uh, for every cubic millimeter. So uh, that's a lot of photons. And so the number of photons is uh, 4 times 10 to the 8 per cubic meter, which is that's the one per, that's dimensionally, you know, 3 degrees cubed. That's, that's uh, what it is for photon gas. Now we expect that neutrinos, which we also know are relativistic or were relativistic until very recently, um, they would count for most of the universe as radiation because they're relativistic degrees of freedom. And if they were in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium with everything else, which they should be at temperatures above, uh, temperatures low enough that we actually believe that this whole picture works. I'm going to tell you early, uh, later on that the, there's a temperature above which we have no evidence that this picture works, but there is a temperature, something like uh, a few um, MeV, a redshift of 10 to the 10, where this, there's evidence that this picture is working. And, and below, at, at those temperatures, neutrinos would have been in thermal equilibrium with everything else because of the weak interaction. And so if, if they were in equilibrium then, you know how many there were, and you can kind of track through how many there should be now. And it turns out there's a, a, few, a little bit fewer than there are photons, and that's mostly because the neutrinos are not quite the same temperature the, as the photons were. Because the neutrinos, because they only interact through weak interactions with everything else, they thermally decouple from everything else earlier than the... Uh, photons do, and, it, and after the neutrinos is decoupled, uh, electrons and positrons go out of equilibrium and they dump their energy into the photons, so they heat the photons up, but the neutrinos don't learn that because they've decoupled. So it turns out that the temperature of the neutrinos theoretically should be 1.9 degrees rather than 2.7, and so that turns out that there's fewer of them, but these neutrino numbers are completely inferences based on we know how neutrinos work, the rest of the picture seems to hang together, nobody's seen these cosmic relic neutrinos. So there's a you know, seeing them is a Nobel Prize. 
Um, but the inference is that there should be a significant number of them. And whereas the fraction of the universe now that's in photons is about five times 10 to the minus five, uh, because we're gonna have to write up the rest, the fraction in neutrinos is about half that. So it's not a negligible thing. So they add up to be about eight times 10 to the minus five when you put them together. So when I talk about radiation, I'm gonna be talking about the sum of them later on. Same story goes through for the non-relativistic matter. Part of that is baryons. And I'm gonna make a case for you that you can count the baryons independent of whether you can see the baryons. There's several ways to do that. And you know that it's the baryons, not something else. So there's a non-gravity way of calculating, uh, of measuring the number of baryons in the universe. So you can test how many baryons there are or how many atoms there are independent of how they gravitate and whether you see, you see them. And that gives you a value of an energy density in baryons, which is about 200 MeV per cubic meter, which if you divide by the mass of a baryon, comes in at a, at a, at a basically a, a baryon for every five cubic meters. So although there's more energy in the baryons than there is in the radiation, there's way fewer baryons because it, you know, the, the baryons are winning because they each carry almost a GeV in mass, whereas the photons are just carrying three degrees. But there's so many more photons that uh, there's, there's about 10 to the 10 times, 10 to the 10 photons for every baryon, but the baryons still have more energy just because their mass is so large. So when I had the story about photons dragging the baryons around, this is why. The, the, the entropy per particle is about the same in a thermal bath, but there's way more photons, and so that's why the photons win. They basically carry the, the baryons around because there's so few baryons in the thermal bath. There's evidence for dark matter, which I'm gonna get to in, in more detail. It turns out it's about, uh, whereas the baryons were something like 4% of the universe, the dark matter is something like 25%. And the numbers I'm giving here are a little bit old. So the uncertainties here are in, you know, I say 0.26, could be 0.25, could be 0.27, but it's not 0.3. So the, the baryons plus the dark matter is about 0.3 when you add them together. But, the, but they, they're, they're coming as two separate pieces. And then the vacuum is the, you know, the whole thing had to add up to one and it doesn't add up to one yet. So one of the pieces of evidence for dark energy is something else is there because we know the total, we know what the sum is and uh, this is how much you need. And the interesting thing will be that there's another way of getting this amount of, uh, the amount by which the universal acceleration is, uh, is expansion is accelerating also tells you how much dark energy there is because that's all that's contributing to it and it's gonna give you the same answer. So I'm gonna switch to slides where I'm gonna go through the, arg uh, the various arguments as to why these numbers are what they are because I told you there's this consistency story. The thing that's consistent is these numbers, but I wanna show you there's more than one way to get these numbers, particularly for the dark matter part. So the ones that are, you know, you won't be so surprised by the photons because you can count them. The baryons, the burden is I need to tell you why you can count baryons without seeing them or seeing how they gravitate. The dark matter, I have to tell you how you know the dark matter's there. And then the dark energy, I have to tell you how you know it's different from the dark matter and how do you know it's there. Any questions about that before we do switch to slides? Okay, so let's switch to slides. Maybe I should turn the lights down a little bit. Uh, oh, I, I should, before I do the slides, one last thing is, um, so you do the, I told you, I went over the bar, that board to tell you that you stick that on a computer and you integrate things, but you don't have to stick it on a computer really. It's, a, it's not a big deal. Because these things are all power laws, the energy densities as functions of scale factor, it means that if you, it, you know, they're all changing very dramatically differently and this was the plot I showed you before of log of rho against log of A. You know, the radiation is falling like one over A to the fourth, the matter is falling like one over A cubed, the vacuum is not falling at all, and if there had been curvature, it would have fallen like one over A squared, but we know that the curvature is at most a percent of what's there now, so it's bounded from above by a, a line which makes it negligible compared to everything else in the past. So anything we talk about in the past, curvature won't make, it, it make a difference. So I'm gonna freely use kappa equal zero in what I do and it's a good approximation. When you numerically integrate Friedman's equation with a de total density that's basically following the largest of these lines because it's the sum of those three things and it's just the biggest one wins. Whenever, in this power law dis dis discussion, whenever once somebody's smaller than the other one, they become way smaller because it's a power law. And so in this region, the Hubble, the, the scale factor is evolving in a way which basically doesn't care about anything but radiation. And in this region, it really only cares about the matter and everything else is negligible. And in this region, it only cares about the dark energy. 
So these solutions that you get, assuming there's only one thing, are actually really good approximations to the real solution, except for where the transitions happen. And where the transitions happen, you can actually do that analytically. And so the, an example is if you look at the, the matter to dark energy transition, the Hubble scale is, the Hubble, the Friedman equation, if I just ignore the radiation because it's so small from here on on, um, the Friedman equation would have been this, where I keep both the, the matter and the vacuum. If I just parameterize the constants to be, this is the Hubble scale in the far future when that goes to zero, and A sub E is just the scale factor where these things are the same size. So those are linear combinations of the constants over there. This you can integrate, and this is the solution. This is the solution that um, vanishes in the past uh, for some time. And you can kind of see it has the right limits, that if I take uh, the HT very, very, very small, then the sine H becomes proportional to its argument, and that's T. Then I raise it to the 2 thirds power. That says that the scale factor for small times goes like T to the 2 thirds. That's what it's supposed to do if it's matter dominated. But if I take HT to be large, then the sine H becomes an exponential. I have an, so the sine H is an exponential. I'm raising it to the 2 thirds power, but it's the exponential of 3 halves times HT, so that becomes just E to the HT, which is what it's supposed to do if it's a dark energy dominated universe, assuming that the dark energy is the vacuum, so it's got a constant energy density. So here's this, this analytic solution is covering basically everything from here on, including this transition really well, and there's a similar solution you can write down for these two. So you can really be a, you do a really good job of understanding the scale factor and the growth of the universe uh, anywhere in this picture, uh, assuming that the, you're not transferring energy between these fluids. It's kind of a, a very clean thing. So in this story, I'm going to tell you in a, in a second, there's a bunch of times in the universe that carry significance. And some of them you can already see here. So, uh, so this is now. We know it's now because it's supposed to be 70% dark energy, 25% matter, and then you know basically 10 to the minus 5 radiation. So that kind of tells me where to say now is. But when we went back in time, there was a time when the matter became bigger than the dark energy, and that wasn't so long ago because they're not so different now. And you can figure out when that is because you know how they vary with A. This one's not changing. This one goes like 1 over A cubed. You just ask, what's the A where they're equal to each other? And then since A and redshift are the same, then that says what the redshift is here, and that turns out to be a redshift of 1.3 if you use the values of dark energy and dark matter that I gave over there. You can do the same exercise as to when the radiation eventually crosses the matter, and that turns out to be a redshift of 3600. And these other two things that are noteworthy are, this is the place where the, uh, the microwave background, the photons stop scattering. So that's when the universe became transparent, and that's the, the light that you're looking at uh, in the microwave background. If you look back in the universe, it's transparent until you get to the point where atoms formed for the first time, and then beyond that, the universe is opaque, and that's kind of why the last thing you see is the microwave background. That, that wall where the universe is opaque is a redshift of about 1100. And, and you, you, we know that that's something like that had, that had to be true because basically the temperature where atoms formed is set by the binding energy of the hydrogen, and you know that that's 13 electron volts. And, so you, and that's characteristic of an ultraviolet kind of a photon. But we see them as microwaves now, so we know that the universe has expanded by a factor of about 1,000 since then, and that's kind of where that number comes from, is that you know uh, everything there is to know about hydrogen, basically. And so, so we know that that happened you know, later than this, but before that. And then this, this one here, if you do the same, uh, I'm going to say more about it in a second, but if you ask the same question about when nuclei form for the first time, so if you start off as just protons and neutrons, when do they form helium, and when do they form various nuclei? That happens when the temperatures are kind of nuclear binding energy sizes, which are like MeV, capital MeV, and that so that MeV compared to uh, three degrees is a factor of 10 to the 10. The universe had to be, things had to have redshifted by that much. So that's a redshift, the nuclear, nu nuclear um, nuclei are starting to form. It, the, the temperature is cold enough that you don't dissociate nuclei once you form them anymore, once uh, the, the redshift, that redshift is about 10 to the 10. And I told you there's, a, an earliest, there's an earliest time for which we have evidence that things, that this picture is working, and this is it. So th there's, there's evidence that this picture of nuclei forming at a redshift of 10 to the 10 that I'm going to show you in a second, there's a evidence that that's actually the right picture. But earlier than this, we have no evidence that this picture is right. So, so there's a lot of freedom to fool around with things at redshifts bigger than 10 to the 10. But once you get to redshifts less than 10 to the 10, 
you have to start worrying about whether you're screwing up things that we, we, we can measure. So the, the map of cosmology, observational cosmology, kind of starts here. And then as there's evidence that nuclei formed, there's evidence that atoms formed, which is the microwave background. Uh, it's important when the radiation and matter dominate because it turns out that structure, like galaxies, can only start to form now. So the clock that starts running here, and you have to have galaxies by now. And that, this would have happened uh, later if there had been no dark matter and all we had was baryons. The baryons, uh, the radiation would have beaten the baryons much earlier. So this, instead of being at 3,600, it would have been at about 450. And it turns out there's not enough time to get galaxies after that, given that the amplitude of the fluctuations that you're starting from are so small when you see them in the microwave background. So, so there's a, it's important where this scale happens. I showed you at one point the power spectrum which had a turnover at some scale. That scale is this scale. So there's physics to do with this radiation matter crossover that you can measure and has been measured. Okay, so, so let me uh, switch over to the, what's the evidence for these numbers? Why, why do we think there's this much stuff? And let's start with, I just want to turn the lights down. Tell me when it starts to look good. <laughs> That's a little too much, maybe. <laughs> How's that? Is that uh, is that okay? All right. So you're looking for the baryons. It's easy. You look up. There they are, baryons. You know, they're, they're, they 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 they've got the lights on for you, so you can see them. And so there's galaxies all over the place. So the first thing you do is you count the galaxies, and you count the stars in the galaxies, and and you kind of try to be more systematic. You try and Locally, where you can kind of see dim things and bright things, you try and get an, an average in a galaxy of how luminous matter will be so that for the galaxies that are farther away they, where you don't see the dim ones, you try and count them properly. And so that leads you to a number as to how much luminous baryons are, are out there. You know kind of the mass, of, uh, most of the mass of everything is in the rest mass of the protons and neutrons it's built out of because most objects in, 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 the, in the universe are not relativistic. And so... That's the basic thing is you count the galaxies, and there are a lot of galaxies, right? This is the Hubble Deep Field, uh, stretched up to show you, uh, and of course now I can see that the resolution's not very good, so it's, uh, I should have got a high resolution version of this, because it's not really true that the galaxies are pixelated in the, in the distance. <laughs> but, uh, but this is the Hubble Deep Field, which you know, I'm sure you've heard about, but it's the, you know, they, they just took the Hubble telescope, they found a place where there's no stars in the foreground in the, in the, in the Milky Way, and they just left it on for a while to, to get a really deep exposure. So everything in that field is a galaxy, and, and none of them are stars. And, and so you, as far as you look, you know, galaxies, galaxies, galaxies. And so uh, there's lots of galaxies. You know, there's 10 billion-ish stars in a galaxy like the Milky Way. There's 10 billion-ish galaxies around. So there's, you know, lots and lots of baryons in galaxies. But you can count them. And a lot of effort's gone into surveying where they are. And so here's a... So one of them is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which you might have heard about. And the nice thing is these people that are paid, paid by NASA, they have budgets to have movies and things. And so, so here's a, they've done a movie of their survey. So, that, so what these people do is they, they just automated the process of taking pictures of galaxies and finding their redshifts, find out how far away they are, because they wanted a three-dimensional map of where the galaxies are. And I'm going to turn these things on. And I'm hoping that this will do it. All right, so now that was the Milky Way. You might not recognize it. And what they're going to do is they're going to pan out. And, and what you're seeing here, I don't think you're looking at images of the galaxies, but what you're, so it, it's, but it's not a simulation. This is like a three-dimensional map of where galaxies are that these people have found in their survey. That grid is not there, it turns out. It's just a, <laughs> that's software. <laughs> so they're panning out, and I think this is, a, th that might be the, uh, I think one of the early ones was in, no, no, actually, they, they were still, this is still a local group, I think, that they're showing us. These are the ones that are nearby. They're better at finding galaxies that are not too close. They're, the way they're looking for them is kind of better at finding them farther away. But here, they're, I think uh, this is, uh, that's the Andromeda galaxy. That's the one you can see with your naked eye. That's the farthest thing you can see with your naked eye. That's a couple of megaparsecs away. So those are uh, orbiting us. Those are the ones that are, those are the galaxies that are not retreating from us. Andromeda is approaching us. And uh, so now we're zooming out still. It slows down here for a reason I don't really understand. You'll see that it, you know, if it's at this rate, we're going to be here forever, but it'll speed up at some point. Yeah. 
So you can see you get a, a little ways out, and partly it's a selection effect, but there starts to be lots of galaxies, and they, they come to you in clusters of galaxies. So they're, they're not so far apart of, compared to their size. You get these fingers of God that look like these lines that are sticking out. That's a measurement effect because they're actually not measuring distance, they're measuring redshift. So when you have galaxies that are all orbiting each other, it smears out their velocities, and if you interpret their velocities as distances, it makes them look like they're in a little line. And it looks like it's pointing at you, that's why it's the finger of God, it's always pointing at you. And, it, and it's not true the galaxies are in wedges. You know, they're doing a survey, they've looked in wedges, and so these wedges are where they've looked. Um, so you see that within the wedges, you're getting, there's a lot of evidence for uniformity and homogeneity. Um, included in the survey are quasars, which are farther away, they're brighter, you can see them farther away. So as you zoom out, you're starting to, the population of things is becoming less regular galaxies and more quasars. Quasars are galaxies that have very active you know, like black holes in their center that are beaming out stuff pointing right at us. And they've been doing this long enough that they've, you know, in these wedges they're surveying, there's tens of thousands of galaxies right now. So there's a real statistics you can do on the distribution of these galaxies. And the final thing they show you, um, I think there's something else they show you first. So these, these white things, oh yeah, here they are, yeah. So the blue stuff, this is, that's, they're, they're showing you the microwave background. So if you, and, and it's not to scale. You know, there's, there's a, what, what should happen is that you look back, the farther you look, the farther back in time you're looking. At some point, there's the first galaxies, and then after that, no more galaxies. And what will happen is that um, when stars form, the radiation that they have ionizes the hydrogen, but in the, what they call the dark ages, before the stars form, the hydrogen that's around is neutral, and so it's really absorbing uh, things. It's not ionized. And the red shifts of the first stars are like, uh, you know, 10-ish or something like that, whereas the red shift of the microwave background is, a th is 1,100. So they made it sound like, you know, they made it look like the last quasar they looked at, right behind that is microwave background. That's because they didn't want to have you go out for a long, long, long distance. But the moral story that you look out to the some point and then there's a wall is true because that's saying that the farther, if you try to look back farther than that, the universe is no longer transparent. The light's bouncing around after that, so you, you don't get to see farther than the microwave background. But the scale of the galaxies compared to the wall is wrong. The, the galaxies would be much smaller than the, the wall. So there's a lot known about where the galaxies are, and you can count them up and see how many there are, and there's many uh, fewer than I told you there were over there. So the next question is, um, how is it that you count the baryons? I want to argue for you that the baryons, you can count them, the, the, the baryons that you would get by counting the luminous matter is not only less than the matter over there, but it's less than the baryonic part of matter that we write over there. And it's kind of reasonable that some of the baryons would be dark, it would be hard to see them. But uh, so now the thing is, I want to switch over to, so what I'm going to do, do now in the next slides is talk about nucleosynthesis. So the, the evidence that nuclei formed back here allows you to count the, 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 the baryons. And the reason is that you're going to see that there's a, when you predict, when you predict the, you, because you understand where the nuclei came from, you get to predict the abundances of uh, the various species of, of light nuclei. So you predict the abundances of deuterium, of tritium, not tritium doesn't survive long enough, but uh, helium-3, helium-4, lithium, and boron. Those things you can calculate how much there should be as a function of how the universe was expanding. And not surprisingly, it, it depends on a competition between, on the one hand, the more stuff you have, the more likely it is that the nuclei collide, and so the more reactions you'll have, and so the more, say, helium you'll get. Uh, but on the other hand, the faster the universe expands, the faster it cools, and then the faster it becomes, you don't, that you don't have enough energy to, the reactions stop because as the universe expands, it's harder for every, every nucleus to find another nucleus to scatter from. So at some point, things stop happening because they can't find each other anymore. And there's a trade-off there between nuclear physics and gravity. And it's all about how many, stuff, how many things are there to collide with. So that if it's going to work at all, it's going to only work for some number of nuclei. And that's how you count the baryons. So I want to, but, it's, but it's, what's great about this story is that it's an example of multiple lines of evidence that you having more than one way to get at the number of baryons. So purely within nucleosynthesis, there's going to be several ways to identify the number of baryons, and they're all going to agree, is the interesting thing. So how does that work? So, so you're supposed to think, and you go back to, the, back to the day, there's a bunch of uh, protons and neutrons running around, 
They're interacting with each other. It's very, very hot. They interact with each other. Sometimes they form nuclei, but just as often they collide with something else and dissociate. So you know, on average, you mostly have just protons and neutrons. But as the universe cools, the dissociation part stops happening because there's less and less energy in the collisions and they happen less and less frequently. So at some point, things freeze. You're making nuclei. You start to, in the end, when it's very hot, you make them, but then you knock them apart as soon as you make them. As it cools down, you stop knocking them apart, so they start to accumulate. Then at some point, everything stops because nobody can find each other to react again, and then you're left with that for the rest of the universe. So the reactions that happen are these ones. You know, the neutrons are, they, they decay. It turns out that there's a coincidence that this, the age of the universe at the time when the temperatures are this high, if you extrapolate back the way I was, is about uh, three minutes. So that's why the Weinberg's book is called The First Three Minutes. He's talking about this, that uh, three minutes into the universe, temperatures are at a billion, uh, at, at uh, uh, millions of degrees, and, uh, sorry, 10 to the 10 billions of degrees, 10 to the tens of billions of degrees. And so it happens that the neutrons, when they're isolated, they decay into protons just because of the weak interactions with a lifetime which is not that different from a few minutes. It's like it's 12 minutes, something like that. And so the fact that neutrons are decaying is also relevant to the process. So neutrons are decaying. When a neutron and a proton collide, they sometimes form deuterium, which is kind of a heavy hydrogen. Mostly, the two-body decays that count, it, it's very rare for three things to come together at once. So when you have a, not a lot of things, and there's only one proton or neutron for every 10 billion photons, so the, there's things that are being knocked apart more efficiently than they are finding each other. It's two-body reactions are the important ones because the densities are, are not very high. And so these are the various kind of ways you can make nuclei. And you kind of see that, that you, you make nuclei with two nucleons, and then those can combine into nuclei with three and four nucleons, and you build things up in a step-by-step -step manner. And the main thing you need to know is that there's two important reactions here. The main one is helium is really tightly bound nucleus. So once you make helium, it's really hard to dissociate it. So it's, it's, helium is kind of an endpoint for this reaction. These other things, in particular deuterium, is fragile. So deuterium happens to be not bound very strongly at all, so it's easy to knock it apart. And so it's kind of, a, but it's the first one you want to make because it's what you get with two prot a proton and a neutron. So nothing really happens until you make deuterium. But once you make deuterium, it starts to become helium and then it, it gets knocked apart so that there's kind of a bottleneck. You have to wait for deuterium to be ready to be made and then, boom, you make a lot of helium and then it's over. And so, uh, so these are the reactions. If you run them uh, numerically, this is what you get for the prediction. So what, what, what's being plotted here is on a log plot, the vertical axis is the abundance, the fraction of what's out there uh, in any species, of uh, any species of nucleus. So zero means 100%, because that's one. You know, minus five is 10 to the minus five. And so, so there's various lines that are giving you the abundance of things. The black one at the top, the H line, that shows you that the protons basically just sit there. They don't do much. There's fewer neutrons than protons because the neutron is a little bit heavier than a proton, and so there's a Boltzmann factor that says you know, e to the minus energy over temperature. So the ne neutrons are a little bit less abundant, and what happens is the, the black line there, the bottom here is time, and you see it's in seconds, so it's in, in ballparks of you know, thousands of seconds, so you're talking you know, minutes and hours. And so you can see that the neutrons, they don't do much, they're slowly getting less and less because they're decaying, because they're radioactive and they're turning into protons. But then at some point, the red line that starts in the bottom left here, that's deuterium. That's the one, the first one you make. And they, they start, start slow, so you make them because it's very fragile, but you can make more and more and more of them. And as you start to accumulate deuterium, the deuterium starts to hit protons and make other things, which are less fragile. So you see that the deuterium climbs, but then it peaks and comes down again because now you're starting to make other things. The green line is helium-4, which is the really stable one. So whenever you make it, it just never goes away. And so it accumulates until the reactions stop running and then it just sits there. And these other things, stuff happens, but then it stops. And all these lines become horizontal because the universe eventually expands to the point where nobody can find each other anymore and then all the reactions stop. And so the fractions you get at, at late times are just fixed from then on. It depends on the window, how fast you expanded in here and how many nuclei you had to, how many protons were there to start with. That's, that's, that, those are the variables. So I'm going to show you a plot of where these lines end here at the end, you know, at the final, you know, in this particular graph, you end up with uh, mostly hydrogen, uh, less, a little bit less helium, which is more or less what happens in the universe. Right? The early universe is mostly hydrogen, a little bit helium. And then there's trace amounts of deuterium and helium-3 and things. I'm going to show you what those things are as a function of the number of 
baryons in the universe at that time. Yeah. It's because of this bottleneck effect that the, you don't get anything until you get deuterium, and deuterium is really fragile. So, so, so you're making deuterium all the time, but it's being knocked apart all the time. So you have to wait for the temperature to get low enough that the deuterium actually stays around long enough to interact with other things. But it, that took so long that shortly after that, you've got so cold that you don't make anything else. So that you, you had to wait for a long time to get the deuterium, and then whatever can happen happens, but then it's over. So that, that's called the, 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 the deuterium bottleneck because deuterium happens to have a very low bounding energy compared to typical nuclear, nuclear steroids, as happened, it turns out. Okay, so now let me show you the abundances as a function of the number of photons. So this is it for uh, helium-4. That's the one, the green line in the previous slot, slide. So what I'm showing you here is the abundance again, the fraction of stuff that's in helium-4. And remember, it came in in that previous slot, you know, up there in the, at that 10 percentage level. And so, you can, so the purple line is the prediction that you would have had. Uh, it's kind of fairly, hor fairly flat because it basically it just says that, that no matter what you do, you, if you, once you get helium-4, it just stays there. So if you start getting more and more baryons, you don't get a lot more helium-4 because it just, uh, it's not that sensitive. Uh, across the bottom here is, uh, is the density of baryons, of protons and neutrons in total, uh, in units, these, these omega units. So, so where one means the total amount of stuff we know that's in the universe, 10 to the minus 29 grams per cubic centimeter. This little h squared is the thing that's basically 0.5. That's 0.7 squared. So uh, when I tell you that the baryon density, omega and baryon, is 0.04, you're going to see that omega h squared is uh, 0.02 is what they're going to look like. Um, all right, so the, the, the dark purple line or pink line is the prediction. And it climbs because more, more, more baryons means more reactions means more helium because helium is the thing that you never get rid of once you, get, once you start with it. The faint pink line, can you see the faint pink line? That's the measurement. So if you look at uh, how much uh, primordial helium is out there, it doesn't depend on, on omega baryon because it's just a measurement. And so what you know is that uh, the consistency of that prediction with the measurement is saying that omega baryon is not zero and it's not one probably, it depends on the error in the, in the, in the measurement, but the, the error is supposed to be uh, in that line. It's bigger than the, the little line, but it's, uh, it gives you an idea that uh, you're sensitive to the number of baryons, but with helium you're not that sensitive to the number of baryons because helium is such a robust endpoint to reactions. But now do the same thing for uh, helium-3. This is a more fragile nucleus. So it happens that the prediction is the dark curve again. It goes, it goes down because helium-3 is being cannibalized into helium-4. So the more stuff you have, the more reactions you have, and the more successful you'll be at taking a helium-3 nucleus that you've made and turning it into a helium-4 where it'll just sit there once it becomes helium-4. So it's a falling function of the total number of baryons because of that. And then again, the horizontal fainter line is the measurement, and it's fatter because the errors are more. And you can kind of see that that's a much more predictive statement about how many baryons you had to have to make those things agree. And you can do the same thing for uh, deuterium. Deuterium is really fragile, so it's falling, the prediction is falling faster again because you make the more stuff you have, the more reactions you have, and most of them are gobbling the deuterium up rather than making more of it and turning it into helium-4. And so again, the faint uh, line is the measurement error, the measurement with the error, and so there's again uh, total number of baryons which would be consistent for that. And you can do the same thing for uh, lithium-7, and that's what this one is. It's kind of a funny shaped curve because there's two different kinds of reactions that compete, and so it's kind of like an interesting shape. There's two experimental things because there's, at the time of that plot, there were two measurements that didn't quite agree with each other, so they put them both there with their errors, and so, uh, but you kind of see that there's a there's a, a region of convergence. And the interesting thing is that one choice of the baryon number gets them all right. So that's an example of more than one line of evidence. That tells you several things. It tells you how many baryons there are. There's 0.02 in this picture, which is 0.04 on that uh, slide. But it also tells you the picture is probably right. If, if these elements were coming from some other physics, there's no reason why they would have to give me a consistent answer for the number of baryons. The fact that they do give the consistent answer is circumstantial evidence that this is the where they're coming from. And so 
This is an, an example of multiple lines of evidence pointing to something gives you confidence that the picture you're building is a sensible picture. So the claim is that nuclear physics and the fact that you can understand the number of uh, the abundance of light nuclei from this picture that you had a hot world full of protons and neutrons in equilibrium and it was expanding world, uh, that tells you how many baryons. That only works if there's, a, if there's a certain amount of baryons in the universe. It doesn't matter if you've seen them or not. The good news is this number is bigger than the number you've seen. The number of things in galaxies is less than this. So that would have been a problem if you would see more baryons than you could make. But uh, it's a consistent picture, and it, sh it predicts that there should be dark baryons, and there are dark baryons. But it also says that there's not enough dark baryons to be what we gravitationally see. I'm gonna, the, thing I'm gonna, the evidence I gave, I'm going to get to about there being stuff in the universe that's gravitating that's dark Part of the argument will have to be that those are not baryons, and that's because you're going to need more of them than you're allowed to have, given that we understand where nuclei came from. Another nice thing that's happened since that story is that you can also count the baryons from the microwave background. You know, the microwave background, it depended on how far sound could travel in the history of the universe to the point where the light escaped from the hydrogen. The speed of sound depends on the density of hydrogen. And so it cares about the number of baryons that are around. So a completely independent way to count the baryons is to get the, is to fit properly the properties of the hydrogen that you're seeing when you see the microwave background. And that's the red line. So the, the green curve and the, the, the dotted lines are two of the curves I showed you before, and they agreed. But they, they agreed, and the scale here is a little bit bigger. And, you can, and this is just showing you that the microwave background is right in the smack where the nuclear principle said that you, the baryon should be. So again, it's consistent, and that's kind of what makes you believe that this is probably how nuclei were made. All right, so now, uh, what about dark matter? So I want to switch from how many baryons are there to how much evidence, what's the evidence for there being, for the abundance of non-relativistic things out there gravitating? And part of it comes from cosmology, but part of it just comes from looking at things that are gravitating that are not cosmology, starting with galaxies. So here's the galaxy that we've seen before. That's the Sombrero Galaxy. You know, the thing about galaxies you need to know is that there's various kinds. There's elliptical galaxies. There's spiral galaxies. The spiral ones are kind of disk-ish, a lot of dust and stars in the disk. Rotating, there's typically a nucleus in the middle, which you can kind of see there, less of one there than in the many of them. And the stars are not exactly in a disk. There's a distribution around the disk. What you don't see in pictures like this is, is there's also neutral hydrogen uh, and there's also ionized hydrogen. There's, there's, uh, there's clouds of hydrogen that if you look at a galaxy in radio wavelengths, you can see the hydrogen because the, you can see transitions between you know, the hydrogen, uh, the, the spins, you know, there's ortho hydrogen and, and, uh, and uh, para hydrogen where the spins of the, of the nucleus, I guess, and the, and the, and the electron are, are are paired. There's, there's what counts is there's a 21 centimeter level between them, which you can really easily uh, measure using radio observations. And so you can, you can map out where the hydrogen gas is independent of the stars. And sometimes where the stars stop, you can still see hydrogen gas, so you can kind of measure the things I'm going to talk about at distances that are, far, are farther from the center of the galaxy than it looks like you should be able to, given that you can't see stars there very much. So what you do, if you want to kind of get an, um, an estimate of, of the matter in that galaxy, independent of counting how luminous it is, what people do is they use the same argument you use in the solar system. That you, in the solar system, we know that the periods of the planets are different. Um, and the periods of the planets are a function of the mass of the sun. Because uh, you know, Kepler's third law, the way Newton derives it, Kepler's third law says that the square of the period and the cube of the semi-major axis is the same for all the planets. And the same thing that, that, that the number that it's equal to, Newton tells you, is related to Newton's constant times the mass of the sun. So if you wanted to weigh the sun, if you knew Newton's constant, you could measure the, measuring the, the orbital speed of the planets is a way of doing that, is what Kepler's law tells you. So what people do for galaxies is the same thing. They say, well, if I can measure the rotational speed of the various stars and things and the gas clouds that are orbiting the, the galaxy, I can get a measure of the number, amount of mass in the galaxy. And so the way they do that measurement is they they, they can't, uh, you know, they're, they're long ways away, so you can't just see them move. But what you can do is you can measure the radial motion by measuring the Doppler shift of the light coming from the things that are, you know, on one side of the galaxy they're receding from you, on the other side they're approaching you if you see the galaxy edge on. So what they do is uh, you take a galaxy like this, you take a 
a slit in your telescope along the galaxy and you measure the color across that slit and you're expecting that one side is gonna be, the, on average, the whole galaxy has got a redshift to do with its overall motion. But if you make, take that out and you compare it all, you make the center zero, then it should be true that one side is kind of red and one side is blue because one side is receding from you, the other side is approaching you, and that's a measurement of how fast things are orbiting around the center of the galaxy. So that's the cartoon of it, and this is what they, so you're expecting to see, if you take those spectra and you plot them, you're expecting one side to be blue and one side to be red. And when you do that, you get what are called rotation curves, and these dots are kind of a plot of what you find, and the thing that you find is that the, the velocities of these stars as a function of radius, it's, it climbs as you, as you move away from the center, as you expect it to, because they're very close to the center, they're moving that fast, but as you get farther out, the geo geomet geometrically, they're moving farther. But then it flattens off. And the, uh, the curve here is the curve that starts off staying with the data but then goes down, that's what you would have expected to find if you took the matter to be the visible stuff that you see and you thought that you used Kepler's law to figure out how that works. And it's kind of easy to see why it gets it wrong because if you had a circular orbit, you know, the acceleration in the circular orbit goes like V squared over R, and that's supposed to be equal to the force per unit mass, which in this case would be GM divided by R squared for a circular orbit. This says that V squared should be GM over R. And there's a factor of two squared there if you want the units to vary. And so that says that as you get, as you get outside the matter, what should happen, because this is the point, this is the rule for point source of matter, not for distribution of matter. But as you get farther and farther outside the matter distribution, this should be better and better approximation. So what should happen is that V squared should start to fall like one over R once you get outside all the matter. And what these curves are not doing is that. So these curves, that's kind of why this, the, 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 the second curve from the top falls, is that it's basically falling because when you get far enough out there, that had to be going like one over, one over R. V squared had to go like one over R. So the curve at the bottom that's climbing is other stuff that you're, you're gonna add to fit, that, to fit what you're measuring. And, and so it's a measure of the matter that's gravitating that you're not seeing. And you see that the evidence is that there's not a lot of it at the origin in the center of the galaxy, but it seems like as you get to the edge of what you can see in the galaxy, you're nowhere near the edge of this matter, whatever it is. It just keeps on growing. And that's kind of why V squared is basically flattening off. And it's, you're never seeing a point where it starts to fall. So the picture, and this is, this is one galaxy, NGC 3198. NGC is just a catalog of galaxies. But y they've done this for hundreds of galaxies, and they basically all do this. So it's the rule, particularly spiral galaxies, they, they all have this property that if you plot the, the, the curve, it starts off, the visible matter is doing what you expect it to do. It's gravitating, it's providing all the gravity you need, but then at some point, things flatten off and the visible stuff isn't giving you enough gravity to describe things. And if you kind of ask kind of how much matter do you need if you integrate over that whole radius, it's something like 10 times what, what you would see in the visible matter. 10 to 100, depends on how you do it. An interesting thing is you could ask, what's the radius where, so if you're in the business of thinking, so what's going on here? Is this some sort of a change to, to gravity? One systematic you could look for is if it were true that there was a crossover between you know, Newton's laws work really well, then there's a radius beyond which they don't work very well. If that was the same radius for all the galaxies, that would be kind of in instructive. It would say that there's probably a, a length scale in nature that we're learning about where gravity changes. And that's not what happens. So if you ask, you know, these galaxies are all different sizes. If you kind of ask, what's the radius where the dark matter takes over? It's not the same radius for the different galaxies. It is true that you can scale out the, if you take the mass, the, the the surface brightness, and you, is you can scale the, the, these curves in a way where they all look the same. And the systematic effect is that the radius where the criterion for the dark matter to win turns out phenomenologically to be when the acceleration experienced by a star has a minimum value. And so there's a proposal for modifying gravity that does a really good job of describing these rotation curves, which encapsulates that. It says that if you were to replace Newton's law, F equals ma, by a new law, F equals ma squared, at a place where the acceleration has a critical, so once the acceleration is smaller than a certain amount, the new law kicks in. That actually does a great job of describing these galaxies. It, you know, so there's other things you have to worry about in that, that kind of uh, picture, but that, that picture is called MOND, Modified Newtonian Dynamics. 
So if this had been a squared, you can kind of see that then we have one over r squared, and so what will happen is that the r's will cancel and v squared will become a constant. And so the prediction would be for big enough r, it starts off for small r being this law, but then eventually the acceleration gets smaller and smaller as r gets bigger. At some point, it, it, once it gets small enough, it kicks over to this law, and then after that, v is constant. And the systematic that that transition happens at a fixed acceleration actually is a, does a great job of capturing the systematics of all these different galaxies of different sizes. It happens to be it's when gm over r squared is a particular size. That's the thing that counts for deciding when the transition happens. And it's not understood why that's true. If you think of it as being dark matter, that's one of the puzzles of dark matter is why is it so simple as that? All right, so that's one piece of evidence. You look at galaxies, you see how things orbit, and you infer how much stuff is in the galaxies, and you know how much there is because you know how fast things are moving. Now, an another way of uh, measuring dark matter, nothing to do with inside of galaxies, now it's gonna be galaxies orbiting each other. So most galaxies are in a cluster of galaxies. You don't see them isolated very often. So here's a picture of a cluster of galaxies, and some of those things are stars, but the big things are, are galaxies. It's often true there's a big elliptical galaxy in the mill middle, and then there's a bunch of other ones that are orbiting it. And you can measure the radial velocities of these uh, galaxies, the same way you can for stars, and what will happen in a cluster like this is you'll get, you'll get a dispersion of, of radii because they're all orbiting each other, so you'll get an overall central you know, Hubble flow redshift, which is to do with the expansion of the universe, but then on top of that, these galaxies will all have a spread around that because they're all moving compared to each other. And the, the width of that spread gets less and less as a fraction as you go out because the overall motion becomes more important compared to the spread. So the, but by measuring the spread, you're measuring the orbital velocity of the galaxies. So you can ask the same question. What, what mass would I need to have these galaxies orbit each other with those speeds? And you get the same answer. You get that the mass is tens to hundreds times as much as what you get when you count the galaxies. Now the accelerations here are much bigger. So if you believed uh, that the, the description of galaxies was because you're modifying Newton's laws at low accelerations, you would get this wrong because the accelerations here are all too high. They don't, the, if something happens to give you dark matter-ish things, it's happening in acceleration here that's bigger than the acceleration you need in the galaxies. And that's an example of how having more than one line of evidence for dark matter starts to uh, weed out theories. So that's only one way of, there's, there's three ways of calculating the mass in a cluster of galaxies. That's just one way. Another way of calculating the mass in a cluster of galaxies is to look at that cluster of galaxies with x-rays. Turns out you see something like this. So there's, between the galaxies, there's actually more hydrogen between the galaxies than there are in the galaxies. There's a, the, the, typically in a cluster of galaxies, they're emitting x-rays because there's a really hot gas of hydrogen sitting in the potential well that these galaxies are making. And it's x-rays, so that, you know, if the sun is not radiating x-rays, the surface of the sun, the corona in the sun is, 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 is radiating x-rays. So the sun is at, you know, thousands of degrees, the corona is at millions of degrees. So it's really hot to emit x-rays. And so because it's that hot, these hydrogen molecules or atoms, they're moving like crazy because the kinetic energy, you can calculate what it is, they're thermal. And so you can ask, how much mass would I need to trap hydrogen for that long enough that I can see it? And so you get the same answer. You set the mass that you find that you would need to trap that much hydrogen in a potential well for a long enough time that it would survive to be seen is similar to the mass you would need to get the orbits, the speeds of the galaxies that are moving around the clusters of galaxies. It's more than what you're counting. It's more than what you're counting even when you include the gas. So the thing is that uh, the galaxies, even if you're counting baryons, was not giving you the most of the, the baryons because the gas has got more baryons than the galaxies do. But there's a third way to get the mass in a, in a cluster of galaxies, uh, which is to do with lensing. So the idea will be, um, the next few slides are gonna set up the idea of, of weak lensing. So the, the basic idea is that gravitational fields bend light, and you can use that to infer the presence of matter in the foreground. So here's an example of some galaxies sending some light. There's some galaxies in the foreground, it's in the, so the, the trajectories of the light rays are bending as they make the galaxy in the foreground bigger. The two purple, the orange rays hit the Earth, and so they're things that we're seeing the same thing twice. So that's an example of a multiply, a multiply lens galaxy. There's one galaxy behind the cluster of galaxies that you see twice, and then this is actually a picture where that's known to happen. And you know that those are the same galaxy twice because things like that they'll have the same spectrum. If, if the galaxy is time varying, you'll see that if something happens, there'll be a glitch in this one, and then the same glitch happens in this one. 
but with some time delay because it takes a different amount of time to traverse the different paths. So, so there's ma many situations where, uh, hopefully you didn't lose something here. There's many situations where um, you know that you're lensing things. And so it's been seen uh, lensing, but there's strong lensing and there's weak lensing. So what this is is, is, a, is a simulation where the blue dots are supposed to be a grid of polka dots, and then the, the red things in the foreground are supposed to be a mass distribution, and then you're gonna see how the grid of polka dots distorts as the light from it gets bent by the mass in the foreground. And I wanna show you this to make two points. So the polka dots are moving, so you see things change. And you see these arcs form. So the things that are close to the center of the mass distributions are distorted in a big way. That's strong lensing. It's like the, the multiple lensing of uh, one galaxy. That's strong lensing. That's seen to happen. You see these, these arcs in clusters of galaxies, which are called Einstein rings or Einstein arcs. If you had a, a source right in front of another thing, you'd get a, a ring. But if it's a little bit displaced, then you get these arcs. And so that's strong lensing. That's you have to be lucky for that to happen. So it's not a useful tool for measuring the mass in a, in a cluster of galaxies. People measure the mass in a cluster of galaxies using weak lensing. So look in the corners here. What's happening is all these circular dots are getting distorted into little ellipses, and it's systematic. Everybody in this corner is distorted that way. Everybody in this corner is distorted that way. Top corner that way. It's kind of perpendicular to the direction to the mass distribution. So what people do for weak lensing is they'll look at a field of galaxies in some region, and of course, you don't know the, or the shape of the galaxy to start with, but you can statistically say something. If I take a field of galaxies, and I assume that they're all kind of randomly distributed in orientation and in size and shape, but I find that I measure a distortion that's kind of systematic across that field, that's probably due to lensing, and then I can estimate how much mass there had to be around, and I can do that as a function of where I am in the sky. And if, the, if there's kind of a pattern where that happens in a circle around some region, that means that I'm probably looking at lensing around that region. And you can do, and by doing that, you can map out the mass distribution in clusters of galaxies, and this is what you get. So these are examples of clusters of galaxies, and the blue curves are, uh, the blue areas are the inferences of where the mass is based on weak lensing. So you're looking at the stuff behind the cluster of galaxies and how, that's, how their shapes are being distorted, and you're using that to infer where the mass is. And when you take that mass that you find and you compare it to how much mass was in the x-rays, and how much you got from the galaxies, it's consistent, and it's telling you there's a gravitational field which is tens of tens-ish, or to hundreds, it depends on the, the details of the galaxy, but it's to 10 to 100 times the visible stuff that you would see. So again, you can count the stuff. It's similar to the answer you got for the galaxies. It's similar to the answer for clusters of galaxies done in other ways, but then there's this classic example that you've probably seen before. This particular cluster is actually two clusters. So there's a, the thing in the center left is one cluster, and the thing just to the right of center is another cluster. And those are uh, clusters that have, uh, you, you know that they've actually passed through each other because when you look at these ones uh, in, in x-rays, the x-rays are not just sitting on top of them. They're distorted in this way, and that's what, if you had two clusters of galaxies going past each other, the galaxies mostly missed, but the gas shocked. And so you get this shock effect, which you can kind of clearly see, which is a sign that they, they've passed through each other and so, so that's, you're looking at a dynamical system there, uh, even though you can't see them moving. And so what people did is they said, well, let's take that one and do the weak lensing thing to see where the mass is. You know, if, it, if the mass is mostly in the gas, it'll shock too. If it's mostly like the stars, it'll go through and not shock. And so they did the weak lensing story there, and that's what they find, is that the, most of the mass that you're getting from lensing is doing what the stars are doing. They just basically went right through each other, didn't know that anything was there. So whatever that is, that's not the gas. So if you uh, compare them, it's, they're clearly different, right? That is not that. And that's the thing they always show you, is that there's a, the difference is, is an indication that the, there's stuff there, it's consistent in all the various, various ways you measure it, but this is actually a sign that it's not interacting very strongly with itself, because it passes through itself when the galaxies pass through each other. So that's several of the ways you have of inferring the, how much dark matter is there, and that's kind of where that dark matter number came from. And it's more than the number, the amount of stuff that can be in baryons, because it's bigger than the nuclear synthesis story. Um, I can see that I'm about to do a, there's one more topic that I was gonna do before doing the dark energy, but maybe uh, this is a good place to stop for questions, if there's any questions. Yeah.
Yes. Right. Right. For cosmology, right. Yeah, for cosmology. So this kind of cancels out the universe. No. Yeah, because for cosmology, when you're just asking how does the universal expansion respond to what's there, that just cares about how they're gravitating. Yeah. And so that just cares about what the equation of state was. And so then baryons and dark matter are the same from the point of view of cosmology. But from the point of view of nuclear physics, it matters that they're protons. And so, so, that, so that, that, that plot was prediction for how, uh, how likely, you know, how much helium do you get uh, due to the nuclear reactions that are happening as the universe expands. And the reason, the reason it depends on the number of baryons is that the more baryons you have, the more collisions you have, just because the mo you know, any one baryon hits more because there's more to hit. If I have only two baryons in the universe, they're probably not gonna find each other and then nothing happens. If I have you know, a huge density of baryons and they're colliding all the time and there's lots of reactions and I get lots of helium. And so the reason that the things were sensitive to the number of baryons was that it, that's counting how often a nuclear reaction happens. So only baryons do that. And so dark matter won't contribute to that at all. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, no one understands your paper. Yeah, exactly. Possibly not even him. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> That's the problem with it. That's what I'm saying. The, the problem is that it's hard to rule it out. Is that, that it's you, you know if you know you know you got a good theory when no people know how to rule it out. <laughs> Did he pass the test? I think so. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, there, there, I, this is here, I should turn the microphones off or something, but it's, uh, it, you know, there, there's, there's, you know, uh, let me say it in a positive way, that there, there, you, you, science needs two things. It needs creative free thinkers who are thinking outside the box, but you also need the box. You need to know what's the evidence for things, you know, why do you believe things are true, and, and often in the public discussion of science, and, and scientists are, are at fault for this. I mean, things, you know, Hawking wrote these books that are great popularization of science, but he very rarely distinguishes between things that pass the, there's evidence for this test, so that there is a consensus that everyone believes, and things that are just speculative you know, guesswork. And, and, uh, and you know, unfortunately the public, when they hear them all talk about the same way, can't distinguish speculative guesswork from solid science, and then they start questioning solid science because they'll say, you know, you think you're so sure about physics, but you're the person who told me that the Earth was the center of the solar system before and you were wrong. So how do I know you're not wrong again? And that's because, you know, the quantification of the, of, of the confidence in, in predictions is not being said. And I would say that at the present time, Eric's stuff is not in, it's not in the box yet. And, you know, more power to him that he thinks it through, gets it to the shape where it can go in the box and then we can test it. And when that happens, I'll worry about it. <laughs> But uh, I haven't worried about it since. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it's uh, everybody should, uh, uh, don't interpret me to saying don't think outside the box because it's really important to have people thinking outside the box. But that's not enough to do just that. You've got to also bring it. Well, I, my experience is that things that are outside the box, they're, they're normally sufficiently ill-defined that, that the people that make it up will just adjust things. They have the freedom to adjust things to make it, everything work as they hit them. And so that's, that's why they're, it's hard to falsify them because they're, it's not really a prediction. So once you actually have a framework where you predict things and you first can check that you don't screw up things that we already understand, then it's a very rigid uh, framework that, that it makes sense to test. Formulas are not enough. <laughs> yeah, you had a question too? You guys think that once the algorithm is out of order, it's going to fail? Right. So, but, but the question is that the, uh, the number one, since I believe that there is not any possibility, there's no proof of the dark matter, right? Dark matter is not proof of the universe. 
Right. And they didn't really know how to take it away. Right. But then, uh, how do you know that? Like, wh- why, why am I supposed to, uh, to, to believe that whether you are the matter or matter that is going to create isotropic property does that matter with it? Why, why does dark matter have like a human like property and red can have a black one? It's a question of scale. So the thing is that in that picture, where I, you know, we had the red things and the dots were going by, you know, if, if, I, if I asked you to believe that things were, were isotropic in that whole picture, then it wouldn't have been true because the, the matter was there and it was actually giving you systematic you know, distortions in different parts of the picture. But if you look at a local scale, small, small scales in the, compared to that, that square that I showed, uh, the assumption is that in a small region, the galaxy where you, you don't have to, it has to be big enough, it has a lot of galaxies in it so I can do statistics, but small compared to the, the scale over which dark matter can be varying. So assuming that, that that exists, that there's a range of scales to which that's true, then what you can do is you can ask for, is there a bias in any one region of the sky for a galaxy orientation? And then you can kind of ask, is there a pattern in that bias as I go around the sky? And you can kind of see it, and if you see it starting to encircle a region, that looks like there's something, you know, you, there's lensing is distorting what you're seeing, as opposed to the hypothesis that it just happens that there's a conspiracy that they're lining up in a funny way. And so, so, the, so the assumption is that on a small enough scale, that you're smaller than the scale over which dark matter is varying, which you have an idea about because you're looking at a cluster of galaxies, so you, kn- you know how big it is. <coughs> and you're, you're, so on a scale small compared to that, but large enough that it has a lot of galaxies in it so you can do statistics, then you, you're, you're asking for there to be no bias in that kind of a scale. Right. It's 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 assuming it's assuming that the uh, that you know the dark matter is interfering with light only through gravity. That's one of the things that's being assumed, and it's assuming that the basic scale of the dark matter is not so different from the basic scale of the cluster. It doesn't. It's not assuming that it's. It, it's not, there's no assumption that it has to be the same size as the cluster, but it, you're, it's assuming it's just assuming that the the scale over which is varying a lot is kind of comparable to the size of the cluster. In this class, yeah. So you can test that by looking at the you know if you, if you found that there was a a bias in your g- galaxy sample that was bigger than that, then you could find that in the data because uh, it, you know, y- the assumption that it's locally not biased would be false, and then you could map out what the scale was over which things were varying. So that second assumption is something which uh, is kind of a smell test, but it's something which you can test for. If the, if the, the thing that would be dangerous would be if the dark matter was changing really quickly or something, but you can, could never find a small enough region that you could be fr- uh, free of some sort of a dark matter physics that was screwing up the assumption. Any other questions? Yeah. Density, you definitely can. So you, that's what they're they're backing out of this is a density profile essentially. Spinning, I don't know actually. That that uh, I suspect not, but I don't know for sure. It's the. In principle, you would have thought that if you could measure ac- infinitely accurately, you know, the, it's, it's probably true that dark matter is spinning. And then and if that were true, there should be some gravitational effect of that. But whether they, I don't think that they can see that if it was there. So my intuition is that I think that they can't tell you whether it's spinning, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Right, that's the assumption. Like this. Yeah. Well, 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 then it would just be this, and this would never happen. Yeah. Yeah. So th- this this theory was one where they said, I want to actually not have dark matter. I want to s- what you see out there is what's there, but I want to explain the rotation curves without requiring dark matter. And the way that they'll do it is they'll change Newton's laws. They'll say that f equals m a works until the accelerations are so small. And then it's a new Newton's law, and that's the explanation of these rotation curves, and there is no dark matter. Oh, oh, because that's because the thing is, if you have, if you the the statement that things should fall off like one over r, uh, you know, th- this is this that's the gravitational force for a point source. 
So if I have some distribution of matter, then this will not be true if I'm still inside the distribution. It's only true when I'm outside the distribution, it's gonna look more and more like this. So, if you, so the statement is that there'll be some complicated thing happening when you're inside, but as you get farther and farther outside, things are gonna start to go like one over R. Uh, and, and so the thing, if, if, if outside meant compared to what you see, you should be outside, pretty sure, because they can measure hydrogen clouds that are outside the stars. And, and there's not a lot of mass in the hydrogen clouds, but they're orbiting the galaxy and they are not falling off as one over R. And so, uh, so whatever is happening, you're not outside the mass, even though it looks like you should be. And then you, you can design a mass distribution that gives you what you see. Okay. Yes. No, I think he just said, well, what would I need to get these galaxy curves? <laughs> and, 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 and the thing is that there's, a, there's an element of genius in that because it really does capture this phenomenology of where the transition is between the dark matter dominated and the dark matter not dominated region in a way that if we really understood dark matter, if, if it really is dark matter and we understood it properly, we should have an equally simple explanation for why that transition happens the way he says it happens because it's a really successful description of the data. And so, so there's... People bring it up uh, because it's a kind of a poster child of a theory that fails for a lot of things, but it gets something really right in galaxies in a, in a way that's probably telling us something about dark matter, but no one quite knows what yet. So uh, I know that we're supposed to end soon, so, uh, but I don't wanna stop the questions and I, I, what I'll do is I'll maybe do one last thing and then uh, unless there's more questions. So the, so what I'm heading towards is a statement about um, dark energy and one more statement about dark matter, or uh, dark matter and baryons. Because I've, I've several times talked about the baryon acoustic oscillations. And uh, one of the things, the best measurement of how many baryons there are and uh, how much dark matter there is right now comes from the baryon acoustic oscillations, which I haven't talked about yet. So I wanna say briefly what they are in cartoon form. And, and, and what they are is, um, is it, it's, it's, it's to do with, uh, it's a correlation between where the microwave background is hot and cold and where the galaxies are in the foreground of that. So people look at the distribution of galaxies and they look at the, uh, where the hot and cold areas are in the microwave background and there's a correlation between them. And which is understood to be there because the, the belief is that the microwave background is showing you that at the very early times there was a very small it wasn't exactly uniform matter. It was un, un, not uniform at a part in one in a hundred thousand. But then gravity amplifies that, and that amplification process is predictable, and and it predicts in particular that there should be a correlation between where the galaxies are and where the fluctuations were in the microwave background. And the basic idea is this: so you're supposed to think of you're looking at a picture here of of the baryon density. So you think of the protons there, and what's happening is is uh, here, I'll just tell you some facts that I haven't explained why, but what happens is that, um, so nobody grows, you don't amplify anything until you're in a matter-dominated universe, it turns out. So, but what happens is that most of the matter is dark matter in the way we think about it. So the dark matter, once we pass this point, starts to amplify. And so you start getting fluctuations that are bigger and bigger in the dark matter distribution. But the baryons don't follow that because the baryons are still shackled to the photons because they're in thermal equilibrium with the photons and that happens until they stop talking to each other which is where the microwave background, but they stop talking to each other when the atoms form and then the universe becomes transparent and that's because it's transparent, the photons are not scattering anymore so they start to become decoupled. So between here and here, the dark matter is starting to form clumpy regions but the baryons are not because they're moving around at the speed of light almost with the photons and then the baryons start at this point to fall into the potential wells that the dark matter has formed and that's kind of where the galaxies come from. So what this is gonna show you is if I have a, a density enhancement in the dark matter and I ask what's it doing to the photons, to the baryons, what happens is if you, if you ding the baryons, they, move, they have a speed of sound, but that speed of sound is close to the speed of light. It's one over root three times the speed of light it turns out because it's mostly photons that are tied to them that are moving in these sound waves. And so if you perturb the baryon density, a wave goes out at, the, at almost the speed of light. And it does that until you get to here and then the baryons stop talking to the light and then they stop basically because now they're moving non-relativistically. So a wave goes out and then it freezes. And you're measuring the time that took from here to here. 
and that distance is in the sky because if you the if the dinging part was if you had a clumping area forming where the dark matter was, that's where you're likely to have a galaxy. So now if I ask, is there another galaxy nearby, there should be an enhancement in the number of galaxies a distance away, which is how far that baryon wave got before it stopped. Because there will be an initial enhancement, and then it'll move through space, and then it'll freeze, and there'll be another enhancement which will be displaced in space compared to the first one. So that should be a relative enhancement in the, in the likelihood of finding a galaxy given there's another one nearby. So people can measure that. They just look where all the galaxies are. I showed you a movie of that. And they start looking, what are the correlations of those? So here's the wave. So there is, it's moving out at the speed of light. And then the color changes because when baryons slow down, it turns out the universe goes green. And then they stop. And so if a galaxy was in the middle, you've got a more likely chance of having a galaxy on that ring than at other places. And so what they look for, if you're looking now back through the galaxies at the microwave background, there's a length scale, which is this distance that sound can go, that is a correlation scale in the microwave background. And that length scale should show up also over here for the galaxies because that's the correlation where you've got a pileup of baryons. And if you now measure the, the distribution of galaxies, as a, the likelihood of finding a galaxy in position space, given that you had a galaxy here, this is what it looks like. It goes down, and then there's a little bump, and it goes back down again. And that bump is right where it's supposed to be if you had sound traveling out in this wave of hydrogen at 1 over root 3 times the speed of light, and then it stopped with this time window. So that's amazing. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those, you know, the hair goes up in the back of your neck when you see that plot the first time. And so it's clearly there. You, know, you see the error bars. It's really, the fact that that works tells you about how much dark matter there was, because that was what gave you the wells that they were falling into, and how much baryons there were. And it agrees, so the fit to that gives you something like this. So this is uh, how much baryons, how much dark matter, and those numbers are the ones that I'm showing you about that. And this is completely independent of all the other ways we had of getting dark matter. So I hope you're getting the picture that there's lots of ways to get at the dark matter. And they all agree, and the baryons, and it's, the picture is something there. And it, whatever explains it has to get them all right. So Nathan, time-wise, I have uh, if I'm allowed to hug the 6.30 deadline. <laughs> okay. So then there's one, I, I want to do the dark matter thing because it's really fast and, and then it'll finish the slides here. So, so the dark matter, there's not that much line of evidence. There's two lines of evidence. And I want to show them to you. Three, depending on how you count. So the dark matter, so the, the, the dark energy thing came about because pe people found dark energy because they were testing Hubble's law. If you look at the, the galaxies, their speed of recession is proportional to the distance from us. But as you get farther and farther away, the acceleration of the universe should kick in. And people expected it to be slowing down. So they thought that there should be a deviation from the Hubble law for the furthest things away, where if you measure the redshift and the distance, it no longer is proportional to one another. But the trick was you had to find something far enough away that you could measure that you, that you knew the distance for. So you needed something very bright with a very controlled uh, brightness. And so what people found uh, that to do that were supernovas, type 1 supernovas, which are, those are cases where you have a, um, a binary system where you had a, a, something which was not a supernova, was not a black hole, but it's stuff has been dumped on it, and then it gets pushed over the edge to where it becomes a black, uh, where it does have a supernova. And there's a correlation between how long the process, so those things become brighter and they get dimmer, and there's a correlation, if you look at the ones that are nearby us, there's a correlation between how long it takes and how bright they are. And it was, a, it was because of that correlation that people felt that if they lo looked at the ones that are far away, you measure how long it takes for them to flare up, you know how bright they are, and then you could figure out from that how far away they are and compare that to the redshift and test Hubble's law out to huge distances, redshift of order one rather than just really nearby. So here's a picture of a galaxy and what looks like a star, and, and you'd, you'd be forgiven for thinking that that's a star in the foreground in our galaxy, that's not. That's, a, that's one star, but it's the same distance as the galaxy. So that's an example of one of these supernovas that they found. And so it's, uh, it's as bright as the galaxy is. That's kind of why you can see it across the universe. And that's why it's useful as a way of testing Hubble's law for large distances. And the way they found them was that you look, and you look for things that appear and go away. So here's an example where you have a series of pictures of the same thing, not that particular uh, uh, supernova, but of a supernova, the same supernova in all six of these images. And you see that it's something bright there, and it fades out whereas the galaxy just stays there. So, so you can measure the redshift of the galaxy, and you know that something happened nearby it that was comparably bright, and then 
by timing how long that took to happen, you can, uh, if you claim, you can figure out how, how far away it was, and from that you can figure out, you can test the distance versus the redshift relationship that Hubble's law is based on, and here's what they found. So distance across the bottom, and notice it's gigaparsecs now, not mega, you know, not megaparsecs. So that's, you know, the universe is, is a few gigaparsecs across if you look at all the galaxies in it, or tens of gigaparsecs. So it's, uh, you're looking at a, a large way across a you know, number of ga the galaxies you can see. And the speed is kind of a silly way to write it. They, they write it as C times, the speed of light times the redshift, which at some point becomes a ridiculously large number. It doesn't mean that things are going faster than the speed of light, but it, uh, that's how, it, that's, it's basically redshift is what they're showing you there. And what they expected to see, so ignore the colored lines and just focus on the scattering of, of uh, measurements. You see there's kind of reasonably big errors in the distance measurements. But what they expected to see was that the trend starts off straight for the nearby things, that's the Hubble law. They expected it to go up. And the reason they expected it to go up was they thought that gravity was attractive, so the acceleration should be slowing down, the, the ex universal expansion should slow down with time. But when you look at these curves, you're seeing them as they were moving in the past. So if they're slowing down, they should appear to be moving faster when you look at them in the past. So they thought the curve was gonna go up. And what it did, you can see by eye, is that it went down. So that means that that's, that, whatever that is, that's not gravity slowing down the acceleration of the universe. That's the gravity speeding up the acceleration of the universe. Now there's a lot of scatter there. And so you might say, well, so, you know, that's what statistics are for, is you wanna actually do better than by eye. So those three, those five curves, you know, the red, black, green, magenta, and blue curves, those are, uh, five histories of the universe for different cosmologies that I'm gonna show you, different choices for how much dark matter and dark energy there is. And uh, this is how, this is what you would have predicted for those universes. And, and, I, and I'm gonna show you the quality of the fit of those various things. So this is just showing you what the expansion of the universe would have been for those various, this is A of T as a function of time for those various universes. And they've all been chosen to look like us in the, you know, now, and so they, they differ in the past. Now this is what, if you ask what's a fit to that, uh, me those measurements, the vertical axis is the density in the vacuum energy in the units that we're using there where one is everything and zero is nothing. And the bottom is the, is the, is the dark matter or the matter distribution. And, and again, one is 10 to the minus 29 grams per cubic centimeter. And so the various dots are the choices that were made for those various models of cosmology. And you see that the, the magenta one, the, 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 or, the ovals are the ones that give you a best fit to the, the supernova curve, the ones that give you acceleration. You need some dark energy because that's the only thing that gives you acceleration. It's the only thing that had negative pressure. So it had to be something that was not dark matter because it had to make the universe accelerate. And so uh, you wanna live in that, uh, in that oval to agree with the supernova data for the expansion of the universe. And so that's telling you something about how much dark energy there is out there. But I told you, that we measured that omega was one, basically, that we know that the universe is flat from the microwave background. So let's put that into this picture too. The line omega equals one is that line. So one of those, the magenta curve was chosen to satisfy that. That's kind of uh, one of its features. But I can show you now what the fit to the microwave background of that argument that the triangle has to be flat gives you. And it gives you this. So that smear is what you can, is consistent with the microwave background uh, for choices as to how much dark energy and dark matter you have. And the colored dots correspond to different choices for the Hubble scale. So the top shows you if the Hubble scale were 30, that would be the black dots down the bottom right. If the Hubble scale was 100, those would be the purple dots to the top left. And you know, you know that you know, 70 is where we know the Hubble scale is for various reasons, and you can see that's the yellow dots. So if we put in the, what the Hubble scale has to be, given the microwave background and other measurements of it. That's the red dots. So that's where the CMB says we should be living on this plot because that's the criterion that we're flat. That basically is saying, you know how much dark matter there is, you've measured omega is one, so the rest has to be something else. In this case, it's gotta be dark energy because that's all that we put in the model. But you know that that's actually agreeing quite well with what the supernova needed to get the acceleration of the universe, the supernova measurements needed. So there's a consistency there between what the curvature of the universe is telling us we should have in the universe and what the acceleration of the expansion of the universe is telling us that we should have in the universe. And it's also agreeing 
with all these various ways of measuring how much dark matter there is. Because they're all giving you that. In particular, the baryonic acoustic oscillations do, but also all the other ways of getting dark matter. So there's a sweetness to that picture, right? You can throw away any one of those things and you still know kind of where the sweet spot is. And it's not as convincing as the dark matter, but it's still quite convincing. There's, a, there's more than one way to get the 0.7 number for the dark energy. And this is assuming that the dark energy is a constant. It's, uh, if you have a different picture of dark energy, then the story will change, but this picture seems to account for what you see. But that is a good place to stop, unless there's some questions. <laughs> if people want dinner. <laughs> so the three oldest, you know, the, 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 an earlier slide, there was a, a plot of the test of the Hubble law, which had a bunch of data points in it. And so, so the, the, uh, if, you took, if you took a series of universes with different choices of dark energy and dark matter, and you asked, what's the quality of fit to the, to the, uh, the supernova measurement? The, the ovals are telling you where you want to be. So that you want to mostly, the best fit is in that inner, inner oval, and then the, as you move out, it's a kind of a, a two or three sigma agreement with uh, that fit. So living in that oval is, is what you need to, uh, to describe that data to the three sigma level on it. No, it's, it's, it's the, what's happening is it's a sound wave, but at that, from here to, so, so the story I told you about the baryons and the radiation is strictly speaking only true from here on because it's only after this point that the baryons don't talk to the radiation because they're not in each, each they don't scatter frequently enough because at, after this point, the baryons are all in atoms and they're, they're electrically neutral so they don't scatter with radiation very efficiently. Before this point, the, the baryons and the radiation are actually in thermal equilibrium, and so they don't behave independently the way I, I described them over there. So they're really locked to each other as one common baryon photon fluid. But it's mostly photons because there's 10 billion photons for every baryon. So what happens is that if you ask where the baryons are, the sound in that fluid is mostly controlled by the radiation so that the, the, it doesn't go at the speed of light, but it goes at one over root three times the speed of light. So it's almost the speed of light. So it's, it's moving appreciably across the universe but as soon as you pass the point where the photons stop talking to the baryons, then the baryons, their speed of sound is now just the baryon speed of sound. And so it becomes something like the speed of sound in air or something. It's slow. And so, so these, the, that wave that, and that fluid with the baryons in it, as they're being carried along by the photons. But then once the photons stop talking to them, then it basically stops. Because it's, it's moving still, but it's moving so slowly that you can't see it in the universe because it's, it's moving you know, 200 meters a second or something. <laughs> so, 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 that's the, so it's not photons that are the wave. But it's, it's a sound wave in this fluid that's mostly dominated by photons, but they're carrying the baryons with it. Because what counts is, in that argument, you're looking at the, the correlation in the baryon density, because the baryons are what became the galaxies. And so you're, you're measuring a correlation amongst galaxies, and you're inferring it from the behavior of the baryons earlier, because the baryons are, you know, that's where the stars came from. So just a few announcements. So, okay, so first thing, I noticed some people leave their backpacks here during lunch. So as long as there's nothing um, expensive in your backpack, you can do it, but um, it's not 100% safe. So you might want to, uh, if you have to leave a computer or something, you might want to take it with you or lock it. There are lockers and things like that. So. I think we've had two computers stolen in 10 years, so it's not a big risk, but. Um, okay, the other thing is we took a picture and we want you to, we, we put a number in front of every face, so it's just on the table outside. So all you have to do is uh, match your name with the number and just put the number there on the list so that we know who is who. So you can do that now, you can do it tomorrow. Um, the other thing is the dinner, so the dinner, it includes a non-alcoholic beverage. If you want to drink alcohol, you can, but then you pay for it, okay? <laughs> so um, the easiest way to get there is take metro. So you go to Republica, like you go back to the hotel, and then you can walk like you're going to the, next, to the green line, but 
don't take the green line, just walk out the exits.